So um, I'm actually now um, a compiler engineer at Embicosm, but my interest in number comes from before that in my previous job when I was a software engineer at Continuum Analytics. And there I would spend time with customers trying to help them get the best out of number for their projects and feeding that back into improvements in number itself. Um, my interests over the past few years have been in the intersection of um, Python code and high performance computing and numerical methods and number falls sort of quite within that intersection as well. So for this talk, I just want to give an overview and an introduction to number, a little bit about how to use it, but mainly I'm interested in talking about how it works and part of that is uh, using the LLVM light library, which is a Python binding to LLVM. Um, I'm also interested if you've got any feedback or comments about number or if you think there's anything that we could be doing better or differently. So what is number? It's a tool that you can use to make your Python code go faster by specializing in compiling it. Most of the development effort on number has been focused around making it work well for numerical code, code that uses lots of arrays. If you have a code that's very uses a lot of object-oriented design and lots of dynamic features of Python, that will be more challenging to get to work well with number because it's not really what its focus is. It is an alternative to using native code perhaps by writing some code in C or Fortran and then interfacing it with Python C API or the C foreign function interface. Um, the advantage you can get by using number um, instead of one of those other methods is that you get to keep all your, all your source code as Python code. And that makes it a little bit easier to develop and maintain, especially if you have some developers that are sort of more familiar with Python than some of the native languages. Um, oh, so Number doesn't do anything automatically in the sense that what you have to do if you want to use it is tell it exactly which functions you want it to compile. It's not a whole program compiler like PyPy or V8 is, and it's not a trace and JIT, so it doesn't, it doesn't execute anything before it's compiled. It always compiles code that you've told it to compile and then executes it. The reason that you have to opt into using it for specific functions is because there's a trade-off that's being made. It doesn't support all the semantics of Python code so um, you're, you're making this trade-off of the Python semantics in, re in return for better performance. The reason that that deliberate narrow focus has been chosen has been so that it can handle CPU and non-CPU targets in a reasonable way without making it too difficult or complicated or restrictive to use. So it's a, a JIT compiler for Python based on LVM. It's got a CPU backend, but it also has a backend for NVIDIA's CUDA GPUs, and more recently, um, AMD's HSA APUs. Now, if you're familiar with Python, you might know that there's several different Python interpreters, but the one that number works with is CPython, because that's the interpreter that most people who are doing scientific, compi scientific computing with Python will be using. Um, people who are doing that will be using libraries like NumPy and SciPy, and the whole ecosystem that's built up around that. So, um, there's been a lot of care taken to make sure that number interoperates well with those libraries and libraries that use them as well. Um, it's BSD licensed and it runs on the three main operating systems, so most people should be able to use it. The development of number has been sponsored by Continuum Analytics. They employ all the developers that have done the majority of effort on number. And more recently, it's uh, financially supported by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who are uh, that is providing financial support towards a 1.0 release of number. I'll talk a little bit more about what that's going to be for towards the end. Um, oops, wrong computer. Oh, so who's using it? Um, the main user base is, like I say, people who are doing science, uh, scientists, engineers, and people who are doing numerical modeling. I found it a little bit difficult to get an, est an exact estimate of exactly how many people are using it, but I noticed from the PyPI stats it's been downloaded 135,000 times from there. However, a lot of users of Number are going to be downloading it through Anaconda, which is a Python distribution from Continuum. They don't publish the download numbers from of their Conda packages, but I would expect that there's um, a larger number of Number users who are using it through Conda uh, rather, rather than PyPI. Um, there's also no big list of um, number users, high-profile number users, but what I was able to find out with a few, a few minutes Googling yesterday 
with people that are using it in the area of e uh, economics, biology, geophysics, and also there's an interactive kite simulator that uses number that you can control with a joystick. Um, oh, so this is a quick example of how numbers used. So um, on the slide, um, this is all just pure Python code at the moment. It's not too important exactly what it does. It's an implementation of the Mandelbrot function. Um, what I'm really interested in illustrating is that if you wanted to compile this with number, then what you would have to do is to import the JIT function from number and then decorate the, this Mandel function with the JIT function. Now, when, um, when you call this Mandel function, instead of that getting executed by the Python interpreter, it'll ins instead number will step in and compile the function and then execute the um, compiled version of the function. I'll talk a little bit about how that works in a moment, but just for now, um, just before I do that, I'll talk a little bit about the performance difference between using number and say C Python. So if we take the Python implementation um, running on C Python and use that as our baseline, so we say that executes at a one time speed. There are some things you can do in Python without using number to get it to go faster. For example, you could rewrite it using NumPy's array operations and it would go 13 times faster than the naive Python implementation. You can do better with number. Um, the, so that number version of the function with a JIT, with a JIT decorator runs about 120 times faster than, than the C Python version. Now that, that level of speed is more like in line with what you would get if you'd written the Mandel function in C or Fortran in the first place. Not every problem works well on a GPU, but because this is quite parallel, that's sort of embarrassing and parallel and easy to parallelize, this is, this is one particular problem that will also go a lot faster if it is run on a GPU. Um, these are a few examples of some other small benchmarks that I had from a number tutorial that I did recently. Um, the point of this is to illustrate that the amount of speed up that you get is going to depend on uh, the exact code that you're running. So you can get a, a various uh, range of different, different um, improvements in speed. So these are all small benchmarks, but remember there are sort of large scale users of number who um, like the ones that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. Um, so it doesn't, it, it works well. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? Although I'm showing results from small benchmarks here, it doesn't just work on small benchmarks, it works on larger codes as well. So I wanted to get into the process now of exactly what happens when a function is called that you've decorated with that JIT decorator. So when that happens, um, we say, say we make a call to the Mandel function from earlier. The first thing that number will do is it will look at the types of the arguments that have been passed to the Mandel function. The reason it does that is that it compiles a different specialization of the code for every um, set of argument types, a different specialization and then it caches each of these different specializations. Once it's looked at the types of the arguments, it can look into the cache um, of compiled code. If, there's a, if um, the function's already been compiled for these particular argument types, then it can just retrieve the compiled code from the cache. If not, it has to kick off its compiler uh, compilation pipeline. Once it does have um, a compiled version of the function, it has to marshal the Python arguments into native types because a Python user will pass in Python objects and the, um, the native values have to be unboxed from those before they're passed to the, to the compiled code. When the compiled code's finished running, it'll have an, um, a native um, return value that then has to be marshaled back into a Python object that then gets passed back to the user's Python code. So, because that, that, that dispatch process happens uh, each time a JIT function is called, there is a little bit of overhead from that. So, just to illustrate that, if you um, take this example of writing a function that, w that adds two, num two scalars together, if we have a version that uses number and a version that doesn't, what we'll find is that the version that uh, uses number actually takes about twice as long as the pure Python version because of that dispatch overhead. In practice, this isn't usually a problem because normally you get such a big speed up in 
any non-trivial function body, but it outweighs the overhead of that dispatch cost. Um, oh, so I want to talk a little bit about the compilation pipeline. Um, so when, when it does have to kick off the compilation, um, what it does. So because number uses LLVM, all of, all of the um, things that number does in terms of the compilation are just things that are specific to compiling Python. We don't have, obviously don't have to worry about um, generating the assembly code or anything lower than that. So there's two ways in which you could um, write a compiler for Python, or two starting points you could have. The first starting point you could use is the AST of, um, of, a, of a Python function, but that can be a bit problematic because you don't always have the source code for the function uh, and therefore the AST available, so that can actually stop you from compiling it. Uh, secondly, um, I think that the semantics of what you have to deal with with a, with a Python AST is a little bit complicated to, to deal with. So the, the other alternative that you can use instead is to get the Python compiler to compile the function to bytecode and then use the bytecode as your starting point. So, um, early versions of Numbi use the AST, but now um, recent versions uh, from quite a while ago use the bytecode instead. So it does a couple of steps, starting from the Python bytecode to turn the bytecode into the number intermediate representation, which is a bit like an FSA uh, representation of the Python bytecode. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about what those steps are, um, but the next step uh, is going from the number intermediate representation to a typed number intermediate representation. So because Python is um, Python code isn't statically typed, um, it has to do something to add type information to, to every point in its intermediate representation. Once the type information has been added, it's a fairly straightforward uh, like one-to-one -one mapping onto LLVM's intermediate representation. And then um, we can hand that intermediate representation off to LLVM and not worry too much about what happens afterwards. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the type inference works. Um, as I've said, we need to do it because we don't have type information to start with from the Python code. There are two bits of information that number uses to add type information. The first, the first thing that it uses is a set of mappings of input types to output types for every operation. So number contains all these mappings within itself. And these mappings say things like, if you add an int 32 to a float 32, then you'll get a float 64. Um, for example, these are sort of almost policy decisions made, in, made within number. Um, the second thing it does is it, it uses the data, w uh, the data flow graph of, the, um, of, its, of its intermediate representation. And it starts by proper starts starting with the types of the arguments which are known at the time we're calling the function and compiling it. It propagates, it propagates those types through the function all the way through to the return values. So for, um, with this uh, example of a simple, simple example of a function, um, if we're called with, with A and B are both float 32s, that information propagating onto the next line, uh, we know that we're adding two float 32s together. So it would look up its mapping, find that the return type is a float 32. So the type of C is float 32. And therefore, um, propagating again, the, um, the return type of this function is going to be float 32 as well. So when there's no control flow, it's straightforward to propagate the type information through. Um, when there's branches, what number will do is to type each branch individually. And then when the control flow joins back up, um, it will create a set of types for each variable that's come from more than one branch. And that set of types has to unify. Um, so I'll do an example of where it will unify and where it won't. So in this example, um, Again, we call with A and B, they're both float 32s. In the if branch, ret gets typed as a float 32, and it gets typed as a float 32 in the else branch as well. So the set of types that we have to unify is, is two float 32s. What we're looking for is a type that's suitable to, that has the range of all those types. So since they're both the same, that unifies to float 32. 
and the typing can succeed. Where it's not going to work is using the same code again, but called with different arguments. So in this case, um, we A might be a tuple of two int 32s, B might be a float 32. Now in this case, in the if branch, ret is typed as a tuple of two int 32s. In the else branch, it's typed as a float 32. And then what it's going to do, what the set that it's going to get that it needs to unify is the tuple and the float 32. But there isn't really a sensible single type that can be used to represent both of those two different types. So what would happen here is that we just return an error message to the user. If we can't type it, then we don't do like a, a deoptimization thing like some other tools do. This, the, the typing's got to be um, consistent. If we can't find a consistent typing, then that's just an error for the user to deal with and change the code. Um, so, um, once, I did say once the um, once we've got the typed uh, type information added to the intermediate representation, uh, we can then pass that on to um, LLVM. So I did just want to talk a little bit about the LLVM interfaces that Numbers used. Um, so earlier versions of Number used um, an interface called LLVM Pi, and that supported up to LLVM 3.2 and 3.3 by wrapping it using a C++ interface. But there was a couple of downsides with the way in which it was implemented. One of the big problems was that there was a mismatch in the way errors are handled um, in C++ and the way they're handled in Python. Because LLVM Pi wrapped the C++ IR builder API, it was, it was possible to write Python code that would cause a seg fault um, in LLVM Pi, and then that would bring down the interpreter. So it's, if you're a Python programmer, it's quite disturbing to be able to write Python code that actually causes the interpreter to die. Something's really got to be wrong. So that was a little bit of a difficulty. The other um, problem that we had with it was that it was a, a quite a large and heavyweight interface, so it was difficult to maintain, difficult to roll it forward from one version of LLVM to the next without a lot of work. And eventually we got to the point where um, we couldn't really go beyond. It seemed too daunting to go beyond LLVM 3.3, because even if we did move to newer versions, we still have these problems um, with seg faults and it generally being difficult to maintain. So in order to overcome those um, issues, um, there was a new binding, a more lightweight binding for LLVM written called LLVM Lite. It was, this was or originally written just to serve numbers needs, but since it was created, it's actually um, grown a user community of its own. Other people are starting to use it in other compiler projects. Um, again, with a bit of Googling yesterday, I was able to, um, just to turn up a random selection of some of the projects that are using it. Um, I also found um, it's complete enough. It's a complete enough um, interface that someone's been able to write a version of the uh, Kaleidoscope language tutorial using LLVM Lite. I think that implements everything apart from support for debugging, which at the time that implementation of the tutorial was written. There was no debug support in LLVM Lite. But as I understand it now, I think you can add, um, I'm not sure of the details, but I think it's possible to add debug information in it. So the implementation of LLVM Lite, instead of using a big C++ interface, it re-implemented the IR Builder APIs in pure Python. Um, that way, whatever, mis whatever mistakes you might make, um, trying to build the IR in Python, you're always going to get a Python exception back. When it comes to the point where we want to compile the code and need to pass it to the proper LLVM, the Python intermediate representation serializ serializes itself to a text-based representation of the LLVM IR and then passes that to LLVM's IR parser. Um, so most of that interface um, that we that we use is, is LLVM C API rather than the faster change in C++ one. When the initial version of LLVM Lite was written, it supported LLVM 3.5. The most recent version supports 3.8, and it supported 3.6 and 3.7 along the way. So it seems that it's been a bit easier to maintain and roll forward, at least so far. That said, 
we're not completely free of um, things to deal with um, is issues, LLVM related issues. So one of them that I thought was interesting that I wanted to talk about is related to numbers queued at backend. So uh, a number uses LLVM light that, that to build the build intermediate representation. And the current version of LLVM light is supporting 3.8. So it's building on 3.8 IR. But for the CUDA backend, we use NVVM, which is uh, NVIDIA's proprietary build of LLVM, which is based on 3.4. So we're building a, a 3.8 IR, which, which, we want to pack, we, which we want to work with LLVM 3.4. Because the IRs changed between those versions, the way we get around that is by using a, a sequence of text-based substitutions. So we print out the IR and then do some string substitution on it to get it to work. Um, these are a random few that I had a quick look at the source of number and picked out, but there's a few more changes that need to be made as well. This does feel like a bit of a, a bit of a workaround to me. I'm wondering, if, is there a better way of making different versions of LLVM IR work together? For example, I, I think I had understood that Bitcode might be forward compatible, but I'm, I'm not so sure about backward compatibility. What are there other people who try and make multiple versions of LLVM all work together? Um, so what I can do actually is using the LLVM three point three IR and the LSS two D for the I to L R. Pretty much the the three and so forth three and then the I to L four or C four. Okay. That'd be interesting to have a talk about later, if that's yeah. okay. okay. Um, oh yeah, so um, the other thing that I know that number developers are thinking about at the moment is how we can, how we, what we can do to get the best out of LLVM's auto vectorization patterns. So at the moment, um, number just builds the IR and feeds it to LLVM in the hope that auto vectorization will do a good job. But are there particular things that should be avoided in order to not hinder um, auto vectorization or transformations or hints that we need to make. Um, so that's something I'll also be interested in hearing about. Um, I'm getting towards the end of the talk now, so I'm going to wrap up quickly. I mentioned earlier that we're going towards or working towards a 1.0 release of number supported by the Moore Foundation. Um, so the things that are to be sort of solved before it gets to a 1.0 release is to support some more of the Python language. It's never going to support all of it, but things like list comprehensions and some partial support for dict would be quite a desirable and probably achievable thing to have. Um, it supports a lot of the NumPy API, but not all of it, so we'd like to add more support for more commonly used NumPy APIs. At the moment, number only works um, with the types and libraries that it's explicitly been written to support as well. The one thing that's underway is an extension API that you can use to add support for your own libraries and uh, types and functions without having to modify the core of number itself. Also, the debugging experience with number can be a little bit rough at the moment. Um, if, if something goes wrong, you might just get an error from deep within number, which can be a little tricky to understand. Um, so some nicer error messages um, would be nice. Also, a cookbook of the common um, patterns that people want to implement with number, just to make it easier to get started with. Um, with in terms of LLVM Lite, um, because it's starting to sort of have an emergent community of its own, um, I know the developers would be interested to work with the LLVM Lite user community or people who are interested in using it, or if there's any patches or contributions that could be made to make it easier for other people's use cases, that would be quite interesting. Um, if you're interested in number and you want to find out a bit more about it or how to use it, this is a bunch of links to various resources and tutorials. I'll make the slides available um, after the talk so you can just follow the links. Um, that's about it. This is just a, a reminder of some of the um, questions and discussion points I mentioned earlier. So if there's any feedback or thoughts, I'd be keen to talk about any of them. Thank you.